Sunday morning, April and the kids stood outside the bedroom door and sang, Here Comes the Bride. Willie was so funny, he was giving it his all and was way off tune and had everybody laughing so hard by the time they ended, the words got lost in the laughter. Is everybody hungry? John asked. The family went outside as though they were going to get into the car and go for breakfast. Johnny and Teresa came out to meet them, and so did Samuel and Sherry, along with Eric and Tammy. Wait for us, Patty and Peter were jogging up that driveway. Let's try something. John centered, and in the blink of an eye, the group was standing across the street in the parking lot where the RVs were first placed when they came into town. There across the street was the People's Trust tent. A big sign read, Today is Wedding Day, closed at 12.30 p.m. The group was still laughing as Here Comes the Bride was being shared as they got seated. Here it was only 8 o'clock a.m. and the party was in full force. Margaret and John Nation drove up in Margaret's car with balloons and streamers flying, honking the horn. The churches that had bells were ringing for all to hear. A line of cars behind the chief was also honking their horns. People were bringing tables and chairs and set them up under tents across the street. When the family got settled, Willie was in John's lap. Samuel and Sherry stood in front of Willie and very carefully set an eight-week-old male German short hair pointer puppy in Willie's lap. The family was all in a position to watch. Daddy puppy, Willie whispered. The puppy looked around and when he saw Willie, he climbed up so he could wash Willie's face. Willie giggled. It was a bond that would last a very long time. The little puppy would get his longevity gene turned on and would follow Willie for hundreds of years. John looked into Samuel's eyes. Thank you, John, for my life. Samuel stated, You're welcome. Thank you for the puppy. John shared. Willie looked up. I thank. You're welcome, Willie. Both Samuel and Sherry smiled at the little boy. Kay. Willie was rubbing noises with the puppy. Tammy had a basket with a pillow and blanket with room enough for four puppies. The little dog smelled familiar scents and settled down for a nap. Nap? Willie asked. Yeah, the puppy is a baby. He needs to nap a lot. John shared. K. Willie watched as his puppy burrowed under a blanket. All around them, people were coming into the town setting up for a big party. John's phone rang. Hello? Uncle John? The voice on the other end said. Is that you, Uncle John? This is Kathy, your niece. Where are you? John asked. Kathy started crying. We are in Glenwood, near Mount Adams. Does anyone have a Washington State roadmap? John asked. Okay, I got one coming. Uncle John, they are charging $20 per gallon for gas. Kathy cried. They took a lot of our money. Okay, I have the map. Can you make it to Highway 97 and come north? John asked. We are in Omak, Washington. I will take care of you once you get here. There's 12 of us, Uncle John, Kathy cried. We'll put you in the bunkhouse. Kathy, you'll have to work, no handouts. John shared. Okay, Uncle John. Kathy sounded better. See you soon. John sat there and thought until Jenny touched his shoulder. Trouble? Family? John tried to smile. Can't be that bad. Jenny looked into John's eyes. Oh my, they going to need help? Yeah. John nodded. When? Jenny asked. Tomorrow, after the mercenaries. Some honeymoon? Jenny giggled. I'll do everything to make it up to you during the next hundred years. John kissed Jenny. Can you do that again? Seth Wilson, the newspaper guy, asked. John said, What the hell? And laid another smooch on his bride-to-be. They stopped when the Wing Tuong they heard applause, and both he and Jenny turned red when they looked around at their friends and neighbors all standing there with big smiles on their faces. Captain Frank and Dora sat down with their four newly adopted kids. Good morning. John, any idea how this is going to happen? No. The Chief and Margaret have this choreographed. There are going to be five couples getting married, and from what little I have heard, there are going to be five ministers, one for each of the couples reading individual names. John looked at Jenny and she took on a nice shade of pink. I love you. Being with you is like a dream come true. It's like my life started anew the day I met you. Jenny smiled. Jenny looked around and realized a crowd of women were gathering around them. Margaret, Tammy, Virginia, and many more women and girls that Jenny did not know. 
The leader of the pack seemed to be Maiden Nation. She had been healed by God and had her immortality gene turned on. Maiden looked and moved as a 40-year-old instead of the 70 years that was closer to the truth. You come with us, Maiden ordered. But my wedding, Jenny asked. Yes, we prepare you for it. Bring your girls, we prepare them too. Come with us. Maiden was not going to be put off. Jenny stood and went to kiss John. Kiss him later. Make him want you. Maiden pulled a giggling Jenny away. John made the motion of sending a kiss to Jenny. He watched as the women moved as a group, and then they just disappeared. Where did they go, Gaia? I've been sworn to secrecy. John heard a giggle. Sorry. John looked at his boys. Hungry? The food had arrived as the women left. John laughed as Johnny, the chief, and Billy with Stephen and Willa distributed the breakfast for the Taylor men and friends. Peter, Samuel, and Eric also came up with their breakfast in hand. Frank came back without Dora, but had Bill McCormick. Let me guess, all of our ladies are off having a party? Willa, how come you didn't go? They asked me, but there will be other weddings. Willa sat down next to Tony and looked up to him. Tony looked down and gave Willa a great big smile. Hi! Ben and Stephen were both whispering and giggling. Boys, be gentlemen, John suggested. He got a smile and a nod from Chief John. Yes, sir, both Ben and Stephen responded and then laughed as they snuck glances at Tony and Willa. John was just putting a fine piece of buffalo steak into his mouth when he heard, Help! Peter was sitting across from John. What did you hear, Father John? John looked around as everyone was digging into their breakfast, unaware of the cry. Even Willie was on his second bite. Somebody asking for help a long way away. John responded in a low voice so only Peter could hear. Gaia, can you tell me who is asking for help? John, there are hundreds of millions of people asking for help on planet Earth at this time. Take care of those you can and continue to expand your influence. Do not bite off more than you can chew. Reward your wife, for she will become your foundation and advisor as you build towards the future. Gaia paused. John, people are ascending. Even though the population of Earth is diminishing, many of those are flowing into here with God because they have not died, like Peter's dad. If they are ready, they are ascending. Jesus created that door for mankind and you have opened that door. When our planet has made it to the fourth dimension, they will again walk the Earth. Gaia did not sound like a six-year-old now. John focused on the smiling face of Peter. Then he looked around at the dozens of smiling faces. Willie stood up in John's lap and kissed him. Do good, Daddy? I guess we have. We just have to keep working at it. John smiled. Did everybody hear what Gaia had to say? Yeah, Dad, we did. Everyone smiled and nodded in agreement. John took a deep breath of fresh air. There will be another wedding. John was looking at Willa when he shared this. Willa only dipped her head a quarter of an inch, but she agreed with what John said. A group of five men approached the tables where John and his family and friends were eating breakfast. Can we join you, gentlemen and young lady? John looked to the chief and got a nod. Yes, gentlemen, how can we help you? John asked. An older gentleman was the spokesperson of the group. We have been asked to perform the marriages. We are Reverend Smith, Reverend Olson, Reverend Mason, Reverend Watson, and I am Reverend Larson. I am John Taylor. John was not very comfortable with five religious men looking for something to do on a Sunday morning. Gentlemen, I would like to take you to God. When there was agreement all around, all the kids, men, and Willow went to God. John looked around and over to his left were all the regular churchgoers, plus all their friends. There had to be close to 10,000 people sitting circularly. John turned to the five ministers. Ministers, this is where you are needed to help everyone develop a relationship with God. Please put in the effort. The rewards are going to be unbelievable. The five men nodded and walked to the center of the circle of 10,000 and bowed. The gathering all stood and clapped. They started with the Lord's Prayer. When that was finished, the five ministers moved to where they could touch God. The families gathered to give their love and to receive a blessing. John Nation came up to John Taylor as he watched the interaction with the five ministers. 
Are they still going to marry us? I don't think they're going to have time, John shared. Any ideas, White Eagle? John Nation laughed as he read John Taylor's face. We could have Master Son marry us, or Master Son could marry Jenny and I, and then I perform yours in the other ceremonies. John Taylor suggested, I did promise my nephew I would perform his marriage. Pete also asked me to perform his marriage. I want you to perform ours. John Nation smiled. Who is the fifth couple? John Taylor asked. Brad Summers. His dad owns the hotel. Last I heard, he was in his last year in a dual major of hotel management and architecture at the UW. He may be done with that by now. He was one of those who followed you out of Seattle, John Nation shared. Who is he marrying? As soon as John asked the question, his heart leaped in his chest. Your niece, April. John Nation laughed at the look on his friend's face. The other three men to be married approached the two Johns. John noticed Eric wore a yellow lanyard around his neck and the other two wore blue lanyards. Chief, where are you at in the training? John Taylor asked. The chief pulled out a yellow lanyard and placed it around his neck. Can you take us back to Omak? John Taylor looked him in the eye as the chief nodded. Men, boys, Willie and Willa, we are going back to Omak. John got okay. He looked to the chief and in a blink, they were back at the table in front of the People's Trust tent. Drums were playing, people were dancing and laughing. The chief felt his neck and looked down. The yellow lanyard was gone and in its place was a red lanyard. The chief looked to John Taylor. A million thoughts passed back and forth between the two friends. The chief knew he had a lot to learn. Taylor asked the chief to watch over this part of the world as he focused on gathering the continents and then the world. The two men were smiling at each other as Brad Summers came up to John Taylor. Sir, I'm Brad Summers. I was told I needed to ask your permission to marry April. The young man was six foot one and looked like a runner. He was holding his hand out to John. John took the hand and shook it. There was a spark when he did. Both men felt it. John saw a vision of a big building with a thousand rooms or more, and then it faded. You like to run? Yes. How far did you get on your schooling? John asked. I got my bachelor's in hotel management, was in my last quarter for a bachelor's in architecture, and on track to start on my MBA, Brad shared. What does God say about you marrying April? John asked. He was still holding the young man's hand that we plan to come together at this time to help you serve God and planet Earth. Brad smiled. Welcome to the family. John smiled and let the young man's hand go. Do you have a place? Brad laughed. My dad has given me the use of the honeymoon suite at the hotel until something comes available. Do you have a job? John asked. I've been working seven days a week for my dad at the hotel. When I'm not running the front desk, I'm painting or fixing things. Brad smiled. I get room and board and five silver dollars every week. I had tens of thousands of dollars of student loans. I think they are gone. What's your dream? John asked. Brad took a deep breath. I would like to build and manage a five-star hotel of my own someday. A thousand rooms or more? John described the building he was seeing. Brad jerked as he looked at John Taylor. You've seen it too? I even know where it's going to be. John smiled, next to the Capitol. And so it was Master Son who performed the marriage of John Taylor and Jenny Roberts. When the I do's had been said, the two hugged for the longest time. The seven kids plus Willa screamed their approval and Bert, Matt, Gaia, and Maria McCormick joined with them. The five ministers stood with the audience and clapped their approval. They had been told their purpose and looked forward with joy as they realized they would be working with millions during the years to come. They would help teach mankind how to have a personal relationship with God. Jenny had looked like a queen. She had asked God if she could wear white and God had said, of course. Jenny had worn white with a small gold crown on top of her head. The other four ladies also asked and felt it was okay to wear white. The girls, Sally, Terry, Fanny, and Lucy, wore pink gowns. Willa also wore a pink gown. When John and Peter showed up in their Scottish dress outfits, Tony asked if he too could dress as his dad was. John asked about Tony's ancestors and heard English. When he saw Tony's disappointment, John shared, 
Tony, you have several knights and a few lords in your tree. Tony decided to be dressed as a noble knight. When he was so attired, Ben asked to be dressed as his heritage dictated also. Ben and Stephen looked at each other, an English knight and an American Indian. The two clasped hands and laughed. They did not care. Their friendship was more important than their heritage. It took John a few minutes to recover. After many minutes, he came back enough to perform the other four marriages. The kids fanned out on both sides of the couple, saying their vows. Jenny stood next to John. The four couples said their I do's. There were thousands of voices cheering on the new couples, along with Margaret and Chief Nation. When people started dishing up the cake and ice cream, John and Jenny met with Tony, Sally, and Willa. John handed Tony a lanyard with a key on it. You will find a box in your room. That key will open the lock. We are going to Hawaii to have some dinner and to walk on the beach. We will be back to help remove the mercenaries in the morning. John hugged his kids. Bill and Nancy will get you home. There is lots of food in the fridge. There are two big pizzas in the freezer and all the fixings for spaghetti. If you kids want, Bill and Nancy will take you to the trust tent and you can buy hamburgers and hot dogs, Jenny informed. John handed Tony two $100 bills. We will be fine, Dad. You two go have some fun. See you in the morning. Tony folded the two bills and carefully put them in his pocket with a big smile on his face. Later, Tony and the two girls, Willa and Sally, found the box tucked away in the corner of his closet. He opened it and found a tray of gold coins, a tray of silver coins and a bundle of $100, $100. Bills, he turned to Sally. As long as we can buy food with money, we will never be hungry again. John and Jenny make good parents. Thank you, God. The three young people made spaghetti that night and cooked the two pizzas. Billy Nation ate with them, and Henry and Beth and their kids did too. They watched some old Disney films and just had a really good time. The next morning, John and Jenny found them all piled on their king-size bed. The house looked okay. Twelve kids and no adults in the house. They are really good kids. Jenny kissed John on the cheek. How did we get so lucky? After the talk with Tony, the day before John and Jenny gathered up the other four newlyweds along with Peter and Patty and Johnny and Teresa. John transported them to Waikiki Beach. The girls had swimsuits on under their outfits and the group made their way into the water. They played for hours in the warm waters. They walked the beach until they came upon the Royal Hawaiian Resort. A man was sitting on a bench looking lost. Can you help us? John asked. What do you, what do you want? The man asked. Is there any place to get a meal? Is anybody renting rooms? The man frowned. You'd think we'd be full up. The man laughed. But we're not. The man pointed at the beach. This place is about as dead as we have ever seen it. I have a meeting going on inside. You may hear shouting and maybe even a gunshot if we can't come to some decisions. Those idiots can't come to any agreement. So they are telling me I need to become the king because some DNA test says I'm a descendant of King Kaukawa, who was forced to sign a constitution in 1887. Has the water level changed from the earth changes? John asked. We got hit with some big waves, 30 to 40 feet high. My hotel was 50 feet above high tide. We think we've lost about 10 feet of beach. The waves came in during low tide or we would have gotten wet. We have had storms hit us during high tide and our lobby did get wet. Happens about every 10 to 20 years. The next big storm, we may get very wet, the man looked out at the pretty water. You have any money? Greenbacks? John asked. I'll give you a match, you can burn your greenbacks. The man laughed at his joke. You got anything else? Silver and gold coins. John shared. Seven rooms, 14 meals. How about 14 ounces of silver? The man then added, in advance. So the party moved inside to the registration desk. John paid the man and asked, when will the food service be open? Where are you guys from? The man asked as he looked at the pale skin and red sunburns. How did you get here? We are from Washington State, a little town called Omak, John shared. We have a Navy Admiral in there telling us it would be better to stay with the old United States. Can you come in and tell us what's going on over there? The man looked at the smiling faces of the party with this man that looked like Santa Claus. By the way, I'm Harry Jones. John had been looking at the faces of his family and friends. They were all nodding and smiling. John, I would like to be able to come back here often. 
This is everything I have ever heard of. Let's talk with these people, Jenny suggested. Who are you people? Harry Jones asked as he was looking at his register where everyone had signed. County Executive of Okanagan, Washington, you wrote down. So there is a government over there. We're just getting started. John had the feeling that this was certainly the case. I've only been the county executive for a day. John transferred the copy he had of the county's policies and procedures for taking possession of buildings without owners to the inside of his backpack. He'd brought it home to review to make sure he knew how to proceed. I would like to introduce you to our group, Mr. Taylor, Harry Jones suggested. John turned to his family and friends. What if we took them to our special place? Yes, was the consensus. John turned back to Harry Jones. Yes, we will meet with them. Lead the way. John and his family and friends followed Harry Jones into a large room. About 50 men and women sat in a discussion about Harry Jones becoming king. Ladies and gentlemen, we have some guests from the mainland. I would like to introduce to you John Taylor. He is the county executive for Okanagan County, Washington. John, you have their attention. Hello, I've always called myself a Seattleite. Every part of the land that I fished on as a young man is under hundreds of feet of water. My family and I were working with the Seattle Police Department, training Seattle's officers on how to stop a bullet. Maybe some of you have heard about that training. John looked around. A man stood and addressed John. Yeah, I'm Sheriff Branch. I've heard of it. Can you stop a bullet, sir? Yes, if you are up for it, we can demonstrate, John suggested. Sheriff Branch got to his feet and looked around at the others. John pointed to an area for the sheriff to stand. Fire twice and I will send one of the bullets back to you. It will stop about a foot in front of you. Simply reach out and take hold of it. It will be hot, so don't hold it tight. John smiled. When you want to, fire away. Sheriff Branch fired twice and holstered his nine millimeter. There before him was the second bullet. He cupped his hands and took control of the bullet, transferring it from hand to hand until it cooled enough. How did you do that? John handed his bullet to Harry Jones. Harry looked at it and passed it to another. I would like for all of you to learn what I know. We have thousands who could come here and train you. We want to take you to a very special place. It is the first step in your training. Are you ready? John got many nods of approval. Take a deep breath, please. The leaders of Hawaii were stunned and the family stepped up, taking small groups to God and teaching them how to ask questions. A man in a white Navy shirt and pants walked over to John. Hello, I'm Admiral Wiggins of the USS Lincoln Battle Group, Homeport Everett, Washington. Glad to meet you, Admiral Wiggins. You know too much, Mr. Taylor. The Admiral laughed. The Lincoln was on the East Coast getting a major overhaul. We were supposed to go to the Middle East. When we got there, we were told to go to Hawaii, then to Everett. The Admiral looked down. We saw the pictures of Seattle, Everett, in all of the West Coast cities. They are all gone. The command above is also gone. There are 25,000 who fled Seattle in Everett in Omak. We are in the process of building homes for them. John shared, there could be hundreds of thousands who fled crossing the state to Spokane. Is my wife still alive? Admiral Wiggins asked. Hmm, Wiggins? Oh, Edith is your wife. John got a confirmation from the Admiral. She hugged me. She is there leading a class in Omak. Ask God, is my wife Edith still alive on Earth? Admiral Wiggins asked. The Admiral heard yes. The Admiral turned to John. You are pretty incredible, John. Thank you, sir. On another matter, we've been told the North Koreans are going to invade our part of the world. Rumor has it they will be supported by elements of ISIS, John shared. ISIS had the North Koreans build them makeshift flat tops to land F-35s, and about the same number of Russians made black sharks, the Admiral shared. Ask God how many flat tops, John suggested. The Admiral placed his hand on God, then shook his head. God is saying 24 flat tops. There will be 144 F-35s, John asked. The Admiral nodded. And 144 black shark helicopters? The Admiral nodded again. Ask who becomes your commander in chief. The Admiral's eyes got big. He was about to say something when a small voice interrupted them. Hi, Daddy. Hi, honey. 
John bent down and picked up Gaia. Now I'm a sugary substance that bees make? Gaia asked. It's another endearment, like pumpkin. John laughed. Admiral, may I introduce to you Gaia? Gaia, this is Admiral Wiggins. Hi, Gaia, the Admiral replied. Hi, Admiral Wiggins. You will become important. Gaia laughed as the man frowned. I'm not important now? Admiral Wiggins' frown turned to a scowl. Gaia, honey, you had better take Admiral Wiggins over to the Christ ports and have him sit down. Help him understand how he fits in with all this. Do you think he is ready to know it all? Gaia asked. Well, you have told him too much to stop now. So tell him all of it. John laughed. Well, if you think so, Gaia giggled. You have been around human girls too much. You opened the bag, the cat got out, and now you're trying to blame it on me. John laughed. Maybe you had better come with us, Daddy, Gaia suggested. Okay. John continued to laugh. The three walked towards the Christ ports. She calls you Daddy? Admiral Wiggins asked. My little girl is an expression of Mother Earth. She is born in 30 years or so. We must make the world safe for her to walk among us. Gaia brings in the thousand years of peace. Oh, so our job is to... Admiral Wiggins stopped walking. To end the war and to end the reasons for it, John shared. You'll make a good leader. Admiral Wiggins started walking again. The three reached the Christ ports. John and the Admiral sat next to each other with Gaia sitting on John's lap with her feet and legs in the Admiral's lap. I hate politics, John shared. Why is that? Oh, because you like to tell the truth. The Admiral started laughing. If Jimmy Cantor can survive four years in the White House, well, there's your model. Not only that, but Jimmy was the only president in the modern era that had no war. God, is Jimmy Cantor still alive? John asked and got a yes. Forgive my math, but 30 years from now, I'll be in my 70s. Admiral Wiggins stated, make that my late 70s. Would it be okay with you if God turned on your immortality gene, Admiral? Gaia asked. You mean I might live forever? Will I be of good health? The Admiral got smiles and nods. Then I went in. I want to see our planet experience a thousand years of peace. You left Everett at the beginning of August? John asked. Your wife was taking some training? Yeah, she told me about that. But we were deep in transferring of command during July. I was going to take out the Lincoln. Eddie was into something new. It seems that many of the wives of the two crews were into it. The Admiral looked to John. Oh my God, that was your training. Many of your present crew have been here. Are you going to allow time and space for your crew to continue their training? John asked. You bet. I'm going to join them. Admiral Wiggins shared. Your wife wears a red lanyard. She could join you on Lincoln and be a teacher, John suggested. I have suspicions she had an affair with my exo. The Admiral shared very sadly. Anyway, the Navy wouldn't allow it. Admiral, you are the Navy, John pointed out. Admiral Bill Wiggins looked at John for a moment. We lost all of our ports and we need a base on the West Coast. Ask God about your wife, Gaia suggested. Bill Wiggins looked at Gaia and then to John. He nodded. Did Eddie have an affair? No, was the answer. Why did she go out with Chet, my exo? To help him keep his sexual orientation a secret, came the answer. Oh, he doesn't like girls, Gaia thought aloud. He had me fooled. I've known him for over 10 years. Is he still alive? Admiral, you are in the fourth dimension. Energy does not die, Gaia laughed. Is Chet still in the third dimension on Earth? Admiral Wiggins asked. No, he evacuated the base in Everett and he was killed when he tried to outrun the big waves. He was in a small motorized rubber raft, Gaia shared. John, can you take me to my wife? Bill Wiggins asked. Take a deep breath, John suggested. Transport happened. Bill realized he was in a gymnasium. There was a crowd of 200 or more throwing and moving tennis balls. Bill looked around and smiled at John. He looked back at the people working hard. There were a few yellow lanyards, but most had green or blue. Bill did not see anyone without a lanyard. He saw a very fit and trim woman come up to John. Father John, I thought you were on your honeymoon. What are you doing here? The woman was hugging John. When it was over and they pulled apart, John pointed in the direction of Bill. She screamed, then yelled, Admiral! 
all motion in the gym stopped. Some of these were Navy wives and had been cut off from communication with their loved ones. Eddie Wiggins wrapped her arms and legs around her husband, talking a million miles a minute. The Admiral was taking in the love he had missed. He didn't know if Eddie was even alive until a few moments ago. He just kept saying over and over, I love you, I love you, I love you. When Eddie finally heard her husband, she stopped speaking and kissed him. Eddie finally put her feet on the floor. Bill, Chet didn't make it. He evacuated the base and housing. Most of us came here in early September. I drove the RV. I was scared to death coming down that hill. Chet saved thousands of us. He's our hero. Eddie took a breath of air. You're alive is the Lincoln, okay? Eddie looked around at her class. It's in Hawaii. We are 100% all okay, Bill shared. Eddie stepped back and turned to the class, announcing, They're in Hawaii, girls. Everyone's okay. The women reacted by hugging each other, crying and jumping in excitement. Another woman ran up and dug into her backpack. She pulled out a 64-gig thumb drive. She handed it to Eddie. What's that? Bill asked. Letters from all of us to our loved ones, Eddie shared. I want you to come back to the Lincoln with me and teach my sailors what you know, Bill told his wife. Will the Navy allow that? Eddie asked. It appears that I'm the Navy, Bill Wiggins shared. We need to get back. John shared, two minutes. Say goodbye, honey. We need to go, get your purse. Bill watched as his wife ran, grabbed her purse, handed keys to one of her friends, and carefully placed the thumb drive in with her change. She raised her hand and waved goodbye. In a blink, they were back with God and the others from Hawaii. There you are, Jenny said to John. Jenny, you know Eddie Wiggins from OMAC? John asked. Absolutely, hi, Eddie. Jenny hugged the Admiral's wife. This is Eddie's husband, Admiral Wiggins of the Abraham Lincoln aircraft carrier. John smiled. One of the men we met in Hawaii. Jenny turned to Eddie. Are you going to Hawaii to live? The two women were off having a great time. John, I'm still able to communicate with the other flagships. We believe a large nuclear bomb was dropped on what was left of San Diego. We lost over 20,000 personnel, and from what we heard, just before it happened, hundreds of thousands of civilians who survived the earth changes died from the blast. I have four carriers left on the West Coast, the Lincoln, Nimitz, and Stennis from the Northwest, and the Roosevelt from San Diego. I'm leaving the Roosevelt along the coast of California. When the Nimitz and Stennis get to Hawaii, I will escort the Nimitz to the Pacific Northwest. Gaia? Yes, Daddy. We do not have a dependable phone service. We have not figured out what is going on yet. Can you help us? John asked Gaia. What? Gaia asked. Can you pass messages back and forth between the Admiral and me? John asked, like, meet me at Gaia's place. Then we'll both know to visit you. Okay, Gaia smiled. What is this all about? Why did we lose so much land off the North American continent? The Admiral asked. If we put too much weight on a steel beam, there will come a time when it collapses. We reached that point. There were too many people angry, and it tipped the breaking point. When the stock market crashed, it took housing, credit, and the dollar down with it. When the banks closed with no sign as to when they might open again, it was not the last straw. It was a whole truckload of straws. We had three days before the earth changes. The elite did not realize the power of the people. We brought about the earth changes. 250 millions of us stepped up and said, enough. All the governors, state and federal Congress members went to Washington, D.C. for emergency meetings. They were going to enact martial law and move all of us into FEMA camps. They are all gone. John shared, during all of this, there was disclosure regarding the Oklahoma City bombing, 9-11 and Super Bowl 50 fiasco as false flags. So we get to start fresh, Admiral Wiggins stated. Yeah, we do, John agreed. That's not all bad, Admiral Wiggins smiled. No, shall we have Eddie take us home? John smiled. Can she do it? Bill asked. Eddie, can you take us home? John turned towards the two ladies. Eddie opened her mouth to say something, but no words came out. Jenny and I will be there, we will guide you. John laughed. John knew what that terror was. It was less than a handful of months ago when he was faced with transporting 600. John knew this was a great opportunity to advance his training in Hawaii. Eddie was very likable. 
She also had the swagger necessary to move the people of Hawaii and the Navy station there. He laughed. She also had the admiral's ear. John called the 50 or so people of Hawaii and his own family and friends together. Ladies and gentlemen, one of our teachers, Eddie Wiggins, who will lead the teaching here in Hawaii, is attempting to transport more than 14 for the first time. John smiled and turned to Eddie. Eddie, take us to the Waikiki Beach out in front of the Royal Hawaiian. John turned back to everyone else. Take a deep breath. A few seconds went by. Then they could hear the waves lap the beach. Everyone was there. A few had their feet wet, but all were on the beach in front of the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. Eddie hugged her husband and cried happy tears. I did it. Eddie, congratulations to you. Let me show you one more thing. Everybody, take another deep breath and close your eyes. In an instant, they were inside the Royal Hawaiian meeting room. Eddie and Bill Wiggins, please come forward. As everyone was returning to their seats, John reached into his pocket and pulled out a black lanyard. John had everyone's attention. We have a five-step training program. Step one is a yellow lanyard. It signifies the ability to stop 10 tennis balls in a row. The green lanyard signifies being able to stop a bullet fired at the individual who wears it. Blue signifies being able to send that bullet back. Hopefully, they are also able to transport themselves. You will also see a few pink lanyards. They signify healer in training. My wife Jenny is an exceptional healer and wears the black lanyard with a medallion with a cross on it. The red lanyard that Eddie wears represents a very powerful individual. They have transported to God numerous times, both themselves and small groups. The black lanyard is our definition of master. Like the black belt in a martial arts, our black lanyard is not a stopping point, but more of a recognition of what can be obtained. Isn't that right, Eddie? John had a black lanyard in his hands and was raising it to place around her neck. Eddie grinned then said, yes. The family clapped and stamped their feet. The Hawaiians were a bit slower. Then they realized how important receiving the black lanyard truly was. They too rose to give applause and voice to Eddie's accomplishment. When the noise faded a bit, John continued, the American Indian always had a medicine man or woman to touch spirit when the tribe was in need. I leave you Eddie, a young master. She can take you to God for you to get your answers. As the group realized the implications of self-rule, the government by the people for the people, they nodded in approval. Admiral Wiggins informed me he will protect the Hawaiian Islands until you can come together to make some decisions. John sat as the Hawaiians stood and applauded. The Admiral was nodding in agreement. Across the table from John and Jenny, Harry Jones stood up. I've been enlightened. We can't wait for someone else to solve our problems. We must do that. My calling is to lead this island paradise. Eddie Wiggins, I want to be in your first class. We have problems and we must solve them. I will be your governor for six years if you want. I am in favor of the Hawaiian Islands once again becoming a state when the United States is put back together in an acceptable fashion. Harry Jones sat down. Can we feed everybody? John asked as he slid a gold eagle across the table to Harry. Harry nodded and moved quickly to the kitchen. He was back in two minutes. He sat down and signed four overnight accommodations with two meals each in the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. It was either this or several silver coins back. John and Harry were working this when everybody stood and applauded. Jenny bailed out the two men. Mr. Jones, the four county executives have just appointed you governor. Harry Jones stood and said quietly, I hate politics. Then in a more normal voice, Today, I've been blessed with a 100-pound swordfish. We've had it cooking all day. We will have a buffet in about 20 minutes. Your meals have been paid for by our friends from the state of Washington, John Taylor, and his family. John stood with him and shook hands. I also hate politics. The two men laughed. Do you know anybody good with writing acceptance speeches? Harry asked. Patty? John asked and the girl left Peter's side and approached. I can help. I got a degree in political science. Might as well put it to use. Eddie shared. Harry found some paper and gave the girls an outline of what he wanted to cover. Harry brought out a laptop, and Eddie and Patty worked up a 12-point presentation for Harry's speech. Harry looked at it and said it would work. He added a few notes and a joke, and he was good to relax and eat with the party. Dinner was served. 
the lead cart coming out of the kitchen carrying the swordfish. Harry sat next to John at dinner. John gave him the Okanagan policies regarding the claiming of abandoned properties. He also shared with Harry about the dropping of zero when going from greenbacks to gold and silver. As dinner wound down, we need to leave, John shared. Going back to OMAC now? Harry asked. There are five newlywed couples here. This is our honeymoon. John laughed. Go! I wouldn't be caught dead or alive in this meeting on my honeymoon, Harry laughed. Admiral and Eddie, smooth sailing you two. John and Jenny waved goodbye. Eddie threw a kiss. Bye, you two. Go have fun. See you soon, John. I should be heading north in about three weeks, Admiral Wiggins shared. Thank you. God bless you too. John hurried after Jenny. The 14 met in front of the elevator. What time do we need to transport? Margaret asked. Tomorrow morning, but we need to factor in the time change. Everyone can meet in the lobby at 2 a.m. The couple split up, knowing they had a plan in place and could enjoy themselves until then.